Hey, in this episode of Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks, we're going to be tapping some ARC with a very special guest from Intel. Next. Welcome back, my brothers and sisters. Did you like that slick transition, baby? Yeah. <laughs> very Chris, slick. Chris isn't here, obviously, doing the knobs and dials for us. And uh, StreamYard wasn't cooperating quite so well, but, but that's okay. We will prevail. It's good to see you all. We do have a very special guest to get to in a moment. But first, let's say hi to the effervescent and bubbly Marco Cipetta. How are you doing, buddy? I am doing okay. How is everybody doing? Doing good, doing good. You know, it's uh, it's been one of those weeks. I'm uh, short on sleep and um, and apparently uh, dexterity with the buttons. But other than that, I think we'll survive. I think we'll survive. <laughs> we have uh, we have a really good friend and special guest who has graced our show a number of times <laughs> in the past. Tom Tap Peterson, uh, the guy that uh, we say uh, we're going to be tapping some arc. Well, he's the tap. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Good to see you, boys. How you doing? Good, good, good. Doing good. Nice. Yeah. How, how how have you been? You've been just a little bit busy these days. Huh? Oh my gosh! You know it's exciting times. I've been waiting for this for three years, and basically we're just now getting in the market with a brand new baby GPU. So it's super exciting. A brand new baby GPU, mm -hmm. uh, the Arc A series, and uh, you've been on what of uh, like a, a four year journey to get this discrete thing going, oh, we've right? Been, we've been working on it for four years, is exactly right. And it, think of it as an evolution where we kind of started with our integrated graphics technologies and pulled that forward, and we found we really needed to do a re architecture to bring the, the core up to modern standards and you know do all the changes that are required. So it's been a labor of love. And the engineers have been just busting their butts. I mean, there's been so much uh, above and beyond effort to get us to this far. So I'm just really proud and thankful for the, all, all the sacrifices the teams have made. But here we are, and now it's time to really, you know, hit hit the metal and get the feedback from our from our true uh, judge judges, and that's our end user customers. So I'm pretty excited to get the chips in the hands of the people that matter. Amen. Let's let's take a step back, though. Let's let's uh, start on you first, so that folks that aren't familiar with the uh, the illustrious Tom Peterson uh, can can get a little bit more familiar. What's your role in the company? What's sort of your uh, your well, certainly let, let's have your title and then maybe your purview from there. I know you're a distinguished Intel fellow. Um, but what does that entail exactly, besides being a sm really smart guy? 
Well, thanks, Dave. I am a fellow at Intel, and my purview is kind of all over the map. You know, I'm a graphics person, so I try to create new technologies that are, you know, kind of visually oriented that make gaming great. And that's really where my focus is on the technology side. I'm also uh, working with some great guys that we are, we're doing performance measurement internally to the company. So we're updating, you know, how do we measure performance in games? And I'm helping out with uh, IGCC. So our, our new ARC control that we're going to talk about, I kind of help take care of that with a great team of guys working with me. So my, my purview at Intel is kind of across the uh, the broad collection. I also spend quite a bit of time uh, kind of on the hardware side, helping to think through what are we going to do on the next generation to help our platform be more successful. That's really one of the main reasons I joined Intel years ago is because, you know, Intel's got this huge portfolio of technology that they've gathered and, and built over the last 30 years. And pulling that all together with graphics in a technology that we call Deep Link, that's like, that's like a pretty compelling playground for me. So I'm really excited about how do we make the CPU and GPU work better and uh, deliver you know, better experiences for gamers. So that's, that's kind of what I do. No question, Deep Link is uh, above and beyond what we've seen so far with respect to CPU and GPU, power share, and all that good stuff. But again, taking another quick step back on your history before Intel, you spent quite a bit of time at NVIDIA, right? I did. I was at NVIDIA for around 15 years. And, you know, I love those guys. They, they have taught me everything I know about graphics. And uh, I still stay in touch with them, you know, as often as I possibly can. So I have great respect for the guys at NVIDIA and they're doing, they're doing just tremendous work. But I, I do, uh, I, I, you know, I do, uh, I did learn a lot. I did marketing there. I did technical marketing. I did, I was a distinguished engineer there and I did similar things, inventing technology uh, to make NVIDIA's graphics better. Nice. And uh, now you're here with Intel and the, the Arc Baby has been launched and uh, you've had just a yeah, <laughs> you've had just a hand in a few of the technologies. I can I can I can see your fingerprints all over it, actually. Can you? So it's, you can see it's it? nice. Yes. Absolutely. Well, my my, uh, you know, my part is small. It's really it's really a large group of people that have been dedicated for years uh, to build this stuff. And on this display stuff is specific, you know, especially I want to thank uh, one of our architects, Gary, who does not get enough credit. He's done a lot of the display work directly, um, of course, working with the architects and the display team there. But really uh, just all around the company, there are individuals that are doing terrific work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and you folks have been certainly beefing up Intel graphics. We've seen the the hires, the new folks coming on, the the new familiar faces that we've seen come in, and uh, <laughs> um, you know, really interesting to watch. Even the social channel growth and the community oh, yeah. outreach that's going on at Intel these days, no which question. is nice. No question, Dave. I mean, that's all part of it. When we when we start getting closer and closer to having products that are, are going to delight our customers, we have to have channels to, to talk to them and to have them give us feedback. So we've been building that out. We have a, a large investment in social media and then all of the normal channel marketing stuff. So I'm pretty excited. I think I think it's going to be great to see as people start playing with our stuff, you know, what's their feedback? And, and that's uh, that's a big part of it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So Marco's here and I know he's got a million questions for you, but I'll, I'll let him poke and prod. And also we'll keep track of the chat, folks. Uh, we will monitor the chat. Certainly send in your questions. We'll try and field some of the good ones for, for Tap to answer. And uh, if if for some reason somebody steps out of line and gets a little trollish, Marco will show you the exit. He's a nice. bouncer, <laughs> nice. as we mentioned before. He's a nice Italian boy from uh, yes. Connecticut. So, yeah, no, he was the bouncer. I did not know that. <laughs> oh yeah, he takes care of business when needed. But but we're, I'm I'm guessing people are going to be nice because you're yeah, such a nice guy. Will. Tap, so oh, we'll be thank good. You. Thank you. <laughs> so we, we actually we actually got our first piece of feedback from I'm assuming is Kelt at Falcon Northwest saying, "Oh, Tap Kelt, is how you doing, buddy? modest, one of the smartest guys in the graphics." Industry industry we oh have to we, we have goodness. to agree we have to agree Come so on. you know since you since you brought up deep link right away and mm. one of the first questions that came in is sort of related to deep link you know let, let's just let's talk about that feature first because that's sort of one of the differentiating things that having an all intel platform that you guys were able to achieve you know leveraging the igpu and dgpu together to do things like hyper encode and uh, hi hyper compute can you Talk about why things like that haven't happened in the past. Like what prevents, you know, a third party discrete GPU from being used with Intel's media engine on CPUs? Just any kind of color you can give in that regard. 
Well, Marco, first of all, I, I agree that uh, all of the uh, deep link technologies are super exciting because it shows that that technology integration that we can do being part of a, a larger organization that includes a CPU. So if you think about it, uh, obviously Intel is open to working with all GPU manufacturers to optimize the platform, but it just goes quicker and it's easier when I can you know, call up the guy next to me and say, tell me more about how this is working. We want to do a better job on PowerShare. And, and if you think about PowerShare today, it's running at about a hundred millisecond loop. And I think we can do better. You know, we can do better because we can connect directly to the interfaces that the CPU team has. And we can say, you know, give me a hint about what's coming down the branch prediction. And can we try to identify critical sections and maybe start doing things much, much quicker. And, and, and by doing things quicker, we can establish, you know, we can deliver better results. We don't need as much margin if we can change, you know, our decisions quicker and maybe become predictive. So on dynamic power share, it's just one example of, you know, being part of this ecosystem where we are fluid and sharing information deeply, uh, we can identify new things. So I, I keep saying that um, people keep talking about how games are GPU limited or CPU limited, and really that tends to not be really technically true. Uh, if you look at a particular game, there's going to be times when it's CPU limited and times when it's GPU limited. And in those moments, if we could put the power directly at the unit that needs it most, that would, I think, deliver you know more benefits. So it's that kind of understanding from the graphics side that can help uh, sort of the CPU team do that next level of, uh, of integration on the platform level. Now, when you think about hyper, hyper, uh, what is it called? Hyper compute, that's, that's the same idea. We can expose all of our different IP blocks, provide a middle layer of software that does automatic uh, kind of distribution of work to those, all the, all the IPs that are present both on the CPU and the GPU. So I just love both of those technologies and they're both looking forward into how you can expect platform differentiation to work from Intel in the future. Nice. Yeah, it's, it's so... <clears throat> yeah, no, it's definitely, definitely very, very cool stuff. Um, now, one of the other differentiating features with Arc, you know, which we'll we'll get back to specs and the GPUs themselves. We're kind of going out of order here. Yeah, okay, but yeah. this is this is <laughs> the, your heart, this man. is yeah. So I just want to get the the viewer question into. So one of the the other different differentiating features is that new media engine, and oh, Intel yeah. is is the first with AV1 hardware encoding, you know, built built into the GPU. Um, can you provide some color on how you think AV1 is going to affect the industry and what it really means to customers um, over time as the ISV ecosystem ad adopts it? Yeah, for, for sure, Marco. I mean, the truth is AV1 is just a better codec in general than prior generations. It gives you better quality at the same bit rate or lower bit rate for the same quality uploading. And it, it, if you do it in hardware, you can do it 50 times faster than software. So what's, what's kind of holding back the adoption of an obviously better codec? Well, it's you need the hardware infrastructure first. You need, you need somebody like Intel to say, you know what, we're going to invest in AV1 and it's going to have immediate benefits today because you can actually do AV1 and store it locally on your PC and then kind of upload it to a service. But by Intel uh, enabling AV1 broadly, there's going to be tons of platforms in the very new feature that support AV1 encoding. And what that'll do is help uncork, you know, kind of unblock the ecosystem and folks, you know, the, the streaming services and the, and the web sharing services. Now they have basically an install base to service so that the transition will happen quickly. So that's our thinking on AV1. It's an obviously better encoder, and it has obviously better characteristics uh, in the codec itself, and we're going to support it. It's a it's a forward-looking investment that we think is worth it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you could see, you could definitely see this in a game streaming application, especially. I know you folks showed Elden Ring and some other, um, you know, use cases with it. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. we've, we have, you know, a streamer on staff, Val, who, who works with uh, lots of different uh, platforms from uh, OBS and, mm -hmm. and different games and all that good stuff. And <clears throat> nine times out of 10, it's the upload bandwidth that's suffering. And so AV1, really should be able to alleviate that. Do you do you think it's going to be pervasive in the streamer community? I would think it's a natural because- I think it is. I think it don't, totally is, David. And it's just a question of when do the streaming services start supporting ingest natively? 
And so mm. it's kind of a chicken and egg. Somebody's got to say, you know what? I'm sure that they'll get there. And what we have to do is enable the client first. And once we enable the client, then there'll be enough demand for uh, AV1 format on the ingest chase on the ingest side. And I, I mean, you can talk to those guys directly, but I believe you'll see uh, most of the major services are already part of the codec organization that is supporting AV1. So it's it's a it's a likely right. uh, timing thing before we see most of the major services supporting AV1 ingestion. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, even uh, even platforms like Netflix currently right now, I think Netflix supports it, right? I think so, but not um, the, the real uncorked not ingest. Yeah. Not ingest, exactly. exactly. Yeah. That's that's what we're looking for here. <laughs> to really make streamers better and to make Twitch better and to make you know anything on YouTube better, we need the ingestion services to be working. In the I mean, meantime, we, you can kind of we upload. You can upload. Yeah, you could look better. We would look better. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if Hard I want to look better. You're going to look fidelity. might not help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to look any better, but Dave, you would look marvelous. Oh, you're kind. I think yeah. I'll take the blur filter. Thanks. <laughs> there you go. So All right. I'm going to I'm going to pop a viewer question up because I think this is nuanced that, that people um, may not have picked up on through the presentation. So we have viewer KW asking, and I know you can't answer this directly, Tom, is asking when Intel's discrete um, when Intel's integrated GPUs may support AV1, because then you'll be able assuming you'll be able to use hyper encode with AV1 as it stands today. AV1 is really just standalone on ARC GPUs, correct? Yes, you're absolutely right, Marco. And, and I can't comment on unreleased CPU features. Obviously, that would be a kind of a one-way ticket to, to you know, banishment. But I can say <laughs> that the core that we develop inside of the graphics team is the same. You know, it's not exactly the same, but the same group of people work on the on the integrated technology that goes into the you know the CPUs. So it's just a product decision. There's nothing really that's blocking the adoption. It's more of a what's the right time. What's the right SOC? And uh, as we move forward, I suspect you'd see some kind of plans around, you know, future encoders and things like that. Gotcha, sure. gotcha. Sure. We should probably get to nuts and bolts now. Yeah, was whatever just, you want to do. That's, feeds. that's however that's you want to roll. Perfect segue. Perfect yeah. segue to. <laughs> I know. We should shift gears, baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So for those that may not have been following architecture disclosures mm. over the last, you know, year and a half or so. Um, uh, Arc is basically made up of cores, slices, and as you get into you know larger ones, stacks, and that's sort of how you you know carve up the GPUs to differentiate the different uh, SOCs. And this first wave of Arc three, five, and seven GPUs for mobile, they're really based on two chips, two different SOCs. Um, can you talk about how Arc is segmented and how you guys you know break things up just at the lowest <clears throat> level? Yeah. So, um, I mean, I think of it kind of the opposite way. Our, our building block, our smallest building block is an XE core. And you can think about an XE core as sort of a computational engine. It does vector arithmetic and it does matrix arithmetic. And it's kind of highly optimized for, you know, doing the compute style for graphics and doing the compute style for AI acceleration. That's the building block. So when we talk about the ACM G10, which is our larger uh, device that has 32 XE cores and the ACM G11, which is the smaller SOC that has eight XE cores. So we're building these two SOCs first, and then we're going to take those SOCs and depending on binning and, you know, turning on and off features, we're going to create all the products. So the slide you're showing there, Marco, is the A350M, which is based on the ACM G11, which is an eight core device, but you can see we have a SKU a350, which is six score. So that's why these product numbers are important. It's it's as we take SOCs and target them towards specific market segments, they get different feature lists. And the ACM 350 obviously is a six core. ACM 370 is an eight core. Both of those are based on the SOC ACM G11. And then you go up to the ARC 5, which is the A55, I'm sorry, 550M with 16 cores. That's obviously going to be based on the ACM G10. And then as you go forward, you'll see more and more cores in different configurations as we go up the stack. So there's nice. a, a, a nuance <clears throat> here too. So the A350M six cores, it, is, it, is that three cores per slice? How do you segment us? Because that slice, if I understood correctly, is four cores per slice. Yes. So can you disable individual cores per slice? Yes. Is that how uh, that well, is? Well, I, like I, so I, I don't want to say that with 100% authority, but okay. I believe that's the case. Okay. I, I assume I it's going to be symmetrical. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. And so in the, <laughs> I, I know you guys have disclosed the detail uh, elsewhere, but in the actual slides and um, 
presentation that you did yesterday. We, we talked cores, clocks, uh, memory, but we didn't go deeper into like ROPs and texture units yes. uh, in the GPUs. So yeah, we know we know core counts here, cache, uh, memory interface. What are what's the ROP and texture unit set up on these first two SOCs? Okay, so the way to think about it is the ROPs uh, and the TMUs are per slice. So there's 32 TMUs per slice and 16 ROPs per slice. What that means okay. is the G10 is 128 TMUs and 256 ROPs. And the G11 is 32 TMUs and 64 ROPs. Gotcha. And do you call them ROPs? Is, it, is that a name we still right. use? Uh, we don't use the name ROPs, but I think okay, that's, yeah, yeah. that's the that's, render, render output. Yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> okay. it's, it's the it's the colloquial term. I just wanted to talk the language that people know. So it's a texture unit, and I don't know what we call ROPs. I don't think it's a ROP. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to get educated on what we call ROPs. <ll> gotcha. <laughs> so I'm right. gonna. I'm going to pop this slide back up because we just got a question from uh, V. Rakim. He says, yeah. what about gra graphics clocks? Why only show the base clock? And I know now Intel in briefings did not just talk about base clock. There's lots of detail in the dynamic uh, yeah. you know, section that we'll probably get to. But yeah. why don't you talk about these clocks? Because this is a wide range. You go from it 900 is. megahertz on ARC-5 to 1650 on to the 1650, top end. Yeah. Yeah. Can, so can it's you really explain how that goes? Yeah, sure can. Um, the way I think about clocks is uh, you want them to be effectively conservative. Like we want to have a spec that users can look at and then they can know their clocks are pretty much going to be at that clock or higher most of the time. And uh, we don't really even spec the upper bound. That's kind of undefined goodness. And we don't really need to spec uh, like the worst thermal case environment because again, users are not going to see that. So what we need to see, what we need to spec is the typical or better kind of clock behavior. And that's what this graphics clock is. It's the average clock in the TDP constrained worst case. So across all of the chips in the bin, like we have these big, big collections of chips that we build our products out of, out of all of those chips, this is the slowest chip and it's in the worst thermal environment. And that way we can say, everybody's clocks are gonna be this or higher basically. Now um, it's difficult to look at that. It's not really a base clock, like in the sense of NVIDIA's base clock. It's more like a boost clock, but not exactly the same. That's why I say these clocks are not really comparable across vendors. I mean, AMD, who knows what AMD's clocks are? Who knows what NVIDIA's clocks are? I can tell you what ours are. And uh, the intention is that they're meant to be ordinal within a product family. That means that if you buy, a product and it's got a name like a, I don't know. Let's pull up our SKU names for a second. Can you go back to the SKU chart for one sec? Um, I yeah. can. Let me go back. <clears throat> Thank you, way. sir. Absolutely. Appreciate it. So if you look at uh, the clock, you're going to see like the stock clock. Let's let's look at uh, just to make it simple. A three seventy M. It's got a graphics clock of fifteen fifty, and it's got a TDP range between thirty five and fifty watts. Right, so it's a big TDP range. This fifty fifty is related to the thirty five watts. Right. So in the most conservative power envelope, 1550 is the average clock that you're going to see on the worst chip in the worst environment on a typical application. If you have a lighter application, you'll see higher clocks, a heavier application, you'll see lower clocks. But the idea is that's the 35 watt skew. And, and so really all of these numbers are heavily TDP constrained. Think of it as you know, the power envelope that we're putting these guys into is 25 watts, 35. This is the low end of our mobile SKU. So these are very heavily TDP constrained, which is what's driving down those uh, average clocks uh, when, when you're running a, a heavier application. Now, if you, if you put it into a, a lighter load, which is the case for a lot of these low end games like Counter-Strike, you're going to see much, much higher clocks well above two gig often, right? So that's, that's the way I look at this stuff. Yeah. yeah. Now, you want to go back that to the chart? Yeah, the, that the, makes yeah, a the, lot the, of sense to me, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. especially for a notebook product app, because, you know, your competitor, frankly, has, you know, something they call, you know, this, whatever, you know, GeForce RTX, whatever. And it could be any number of different clock speeds and there's no, you know, specified one. And so this is, a, to me, it's a little bit more clear. We're trying. Um, We're trying. It's a tough, it's a it's a tough thing to describe to people. I I'm looking forward to add-in cards, right? And so when you get to add-in cards, people really do want to know. Oh, this is base. This is you know this is the basic one. This is a little better. This is a little better. You want to have yeah. a way for an end user to go, mm, and then a little better, and a little better, and a little better. And that's what the the graphics clock is meant to be. It's meant to right. say within one skew, if the graphics clock is getting higher, then those skews are intended to be higher performance. 
Yeah. Right. That's that's yeah. the way it's really going to be useful. So let's talk about how it how it's calculated and how it works. You know, we've already mentioned that all of our clocks are dynamic, which means that they're, we're increasing the voltage uh, dynamically and we're changing the frequency of every chip based on real time information like power, temperature, utilization, stuff like that. So if you go forward, you'll see when you have a oh, OK, we're just going to do clock definition. So that means. You know, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank Sorry, you. For that, Mark. We, okay. we don't we don't have every slide. So we're we're sharing our article. I'll no drop it in the problem. chat. No so problem. People that want to see that. Uh, I'll roll with you, baby. So you uh, what you're looking at here is uh, <laughs> my representation of a distribution of clocks. It's kind of, a you know, there's lots of stuff going on there, but we, we often will be running around the gra graphics clock. Sometimes we're going to run higher. Sometimes we're going to run lower, but that's the way we're going to define this, this part so that people can get a sense of, you know, what clock should I expect to see? So this is a, a typical workload. It's going to have clocks going up and down and it's in the worst TDP environment for that SKU. So again, this would be like a 35 watt TDP for this part. It would run, I think, 1550 or whatever for the for the part we just talked about. Yep. You know, an Got anecdotally for, every, for everybody watching, you know, every single graphic desktop graphics card I've tested, you know, we get a spec sheet that says a base clock and a boost clock. And if it's a, a an OEM card with a, a particularly good cooler, those clocks mean nothing. It routinely you know, goes higher than those clocks all the time. So these are just sort of guidelines based on worst case scenario that a company can basically guarantee when you buy it, it will at least hit that clock, but you typically get much better than that, yeah. especially in solutions with better cooling setups, you know? Yeah. Thanks for that, Marco. That's really true. Yeah. And and I got to say, I mean, I've looked at, as you know, many GPUs over the years and our GPUs are fast. I mean, they are, mm -hmm. they they get high clocks. And I think we're going to see more about that as we get uh, out and, and more people start looking at the silicon. Mm, yeah. I want to see them Definitely. where we're, we're I shouldn't getting... say too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's go. Let's go strategy for one second, because the question that came in, I'm not going to ask it the way that it was asked in the was chat. It, was it but... a little spicy in the chat? Yes, it was a little. Eh, maybe. No, it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't. But people too bad, no. are mm. wondering. This launch is. It's. It's not. It's sort of the opposite of some other launches. Instead of starting with your big Halo product, you're starting with a, a mainstream product for you know a, a broad appeal sort of market segment in mobile. Can you talk about sort of Intel's strategy? Why why we're starting with Arc three and you're sort of building to the crescendo. Uh, for sure. I mean, I totally understand the question. And if I were uh, if I were a little further away from it, I wouldn't be surprised by the by the confusion. But uh, the truth is, it makes perfect sense for Intel because we ship uh, the majority of notebooks in the world. So if you were trying to find a position of strength that we could uh, leverage as we launch our graphics, it would basically you know kind of go there where we have most of the mobile designs in the world. Let's make those mobile designs better. And we know that we know how the you know how the notebook market works. We have long relationships with all the notebook OEMs, so it's just a natural thing. It's an evolution of our kind of IP innovation on notebook platform. And now we have discrete graphics. It makes perfect sense. Now for the future, obviously we're building out a top to bottom stack, and it includes discrete cards. So those are going to be coming in the summer, and I'm super excited about what those are going to do for gamers. But in terms of strategy, it, it always makes sense to start from a position of strength where we can do technologies like deep link, where we can do uh, technologies like, you know, dy dynamic power sharing and all that kind of really cool platform level integration to start off with a, a solid differentiated uh, capability. But going forward, obviously, discrete is super important to us. And uh, we're going to get there just as soon as we can later this summer. Makes yeah. a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. So I was going to say, again, just another anecdote. I'm sorry, Dave, to cut you off. Just no, for, for everybody for watching, like even though hot hardware's roots are in enthusiast computing and we love the biggest, baddest PCs you can get, you know, it hasn't happened a lot recently because of COVID. But when we're on the road, right, I prefer a small 14, 13.3 inch notebook. And I've always been underserved in terms of GPU horsepower in that form factor. So and we do lots of media encoding on the road. We're shooting video, we're doing whatever. So this platform is actually, I'm really looking forward to it personally because it may help my workflow, assuming everything you know tests the way Intel has presented. This is a platform that would really help my workflow on the road. And it looks like that's going to start picking up again. So this setup, yeah, it's not the biggest, baddest out of the gate, 
but it is addressing you know a, a, a broad range of the market. I, oh, I sorry to cut you off there, Dave. No, it's a great way to great, great way to say uh, it. Michael. The way I, I like to present it is it's solving a real problem for users, right? It's it's a, it's a if you're doing content creation, you're doing media, and you want a mobile form factor that you like the game on. Uh, I would get this platform. And Marco, you need to call me. I'll see what I can do. Okay. Call me. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I'll be calling. I'll definitely be calling. <laughs> we've been we've been hounding our friends at Samsung, and uh, uh, you know we, we hear they're going to be one of the first out of the gate. But yes. I'm sure there'll be others. We'll be tapping on folks like Dell and Lenovo and mm -hmm. all those good guys. But yeah, no, I'm I'm in the same boat. I mean, uh, you know, hyper encode, especially for me, sounds like you know perfect little uh, you know road warrior tool because we do oh, a lot yeah. of that on scene kind of stuff and. You know, it's good to have the chops. So I got to say, it's super stuff. exciting. I want a shout out to Charlie Wang, who's one of our architects who kind of made that thing happen. And I, I just, when they described it to him, I'm like, that's perfect, right? That that technology, people are going to love it because right now, all the IP that's in your CPU is mostly dormant when you have a discrete GPU attached to it, and that's a shame, right? You, you don't want to you don't want to leave transistors behind. They have they want to be loved. And so what Hyper Encode does is it allows us to turn on everything you've got in your platform and deliver better experiences. And I, I think Charlie's done a great job there. Yeah, yeah. We'll toss a little uh, little comment up from Kevin in the chat. Kevin Crewell says, crawl before you walk, <laughs> walk before you run. That also makes sense as well, by the way. I it mean, does. let's let's face it, you know, you're you have a you have a smaller slab of silicon here that you're qualifying and all that good stuff. And you know, it helps to, you know, cut your teeth there and then get to the big guns. But Kevin um, is a wise man. I've known him for many years. So thanks for the support there, brother. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's a good dude for sure. Good to see you, Kev. Good to see you mm -hmm. from Terrius Research. Um, all right. Well, um, what else? Let's let's talk about you want to uh, let's go to features and I'll talk a little bit about uh, some things that might be near and dear to Tom's heart. Sure. Okay. Yeah, you want you want me? Let's let's so, go to the display yeah. end. Oh, you're gonna go. Or I was gonna go I was go gonna to, tee okay. that up. Yeah. So <laughs> we know we know display technologies are near and dear to your heart. They uh, are. Tap and um, you've done some work in that realm in your prior lives as well. Yeah. Yesterday, you guys talked about uh, support for adaptive refresh rate technologies, and disclosed speed sync and smooth sync. Can you talk about what speed sync and smooth sync do differently? And you know, I guess kind of. What makes them special? Because some of them sound a little familiar, and smooth sync is something totally new. So you got a little mix of both there, for sure. Uh, so first of all, you're absolutely right. I, I do I do get geeky about display technology. Yes, you do. And, and starting <laughs> with adaptive sync, it's the variable refresh rate technology standard from Visa, and we are 100% all in on that. It's going to work across our full stack, and that that technology obviously makes the panel refresh in sync with the graphics card. And it's great when your game render rate or sort of sub the refresh rate, like 40, 50 frames per second, it turns it from a stuttery mess to make it beautiful. So we're really excited to support adaptive sync and you'll see multiple different notebook panels uh, supporting adaptive sync. Speed sync is a slightly different take on this. So if you don't have a, or even when you do have an adaptive sync panel, you still play games that are running really high render rates. So if you're running Counter-Strike, you're getting 150 frames per second or whatever it is, maybe 200 frames per second, and you turn V-Sync off, you're going to get all this tearing, even with an adaptive sync panel. Because when the render rate's higher than the panel, it doesn't do anything really. It's just, it's going to tear. So to make that better with um, speed sync, what we actually do is, we virtualize the flip queue or virtualize the uh, swap chain. And what that means is the game thinks it's tearing. It's just flipping, 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 rendering as fast as it possibly can with the lowest latency. But what we're actually doing under the covers is we're going to hold that image, the last rendered image, and we're going to put that on the screen. We're going to show the whole thing. So even though the game is off on its way, rendering, 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 we're not showing you all of those unneeded frames. And then when it finishes a refresh, we're going to pick the last rendered frame again, and we're going to show you that one on the screen. So it kind of gives you the benefit of um, no tearing. And so it's kind of like VSync on in that case. But the truth is VSync is off in the game. So latencies are very, very short. That's a pretty cool technology. Um, nice. The last, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say that that sounds great. Um, uh, smooth sync is something different. And Marco, I don't know if you can uh, bring up a visual on that so we can see it, because I, I think can. that's kind of poor. Yeah, this is yeah. great. So smooth there sync is a, it's a new technology. It's Intel only. And what it does is kind of cool. It, it, on the left-hand side, I'm showing B-Sync off. And this is typical, again, when you want low latency. And you see this tear. That's when the top part of the screen, the top part of the refresh, is showing you an older frame. 
and then the new frame gets rendered and it starts showing you the new frame. That's what tearing is. You're looking at part of an old frame and part of a new frame. Well, with Smooth Sync, what we actually do is inside of our display engine, which is busily scanning out, it goes, whoa, holy shit, there's a tear coming. So <laughs> instead of just showing you the tear, it says, wait a second, and it starts blending from the old frame to the new frame. And that's why on the right-hand side, you see this dither pattern that's kind of showing you, it looks kind of like it's not tearing, but if you look closely, you'll see the bar on the right-hand side, you know, the vertical bar all the way on the right-hand side. It's clearly tearing, right? But it's all blurred across that boundary. So your eye doesn't really see it. And that's super important to quote uh, uh, from uh, Kelt. He said, deep monkey brains. Yeah, so it's like somewhere <laughs> deep in your monkey, in your monkey brain, it, it, you're firing because you're trying not to get eaten by a, a lion or something. When you see something like a tear, your brain interprets it as really fast acceleration. And it's very jarring that deep monkey wakes up. So when we smooth it out on the right hand side, things are a little bit softer and your brain doesn't react so harsh and you get a ple more pleasant experience. It's not perfect, right? It's not like not tearing, but it's much better than tearing. And is there a significant performance impact here when this is enabled? Not really. I'm, and, you know, I argue whether there's any. And, and the guys inside uh, Intel tell me you have to say there's a performance impact. But let me tell you what's actually happening. When we do this blurring, we're actually blurring on the new frame. So there's no delay like latency or anything like that. We start scanning out the new frame at the, exactly the same time we would have. But what's happening is we're not showing you that data. We're actually showing you parts of the old frame. And it takes about 32 scan lines uh, to do this blur. So the guys want me to say, it depends on how you think about it, it takes us 32 scan lines to show you the true new frame. Um, and uh, you'll see most of the new frame after 16 scan lines, which turns out to be, depending on your refresh rate, somewhere around half a millisecond. But it, but again, it's, it's not really delayed. It's <clears> just <throat> we're doing this blend. So that blend uh, causes you to not see the new frame as quickly as you would have. Nice. Is it, is it, uh, how are you enabling it? Is it done on a shader and uh, like a post-processing effect? No, it's or? a hardware block inside of our display engine. So it's not doing nice. any kind of post. It's just, you know, we already have some buffers inside of our, our display engine for just covering latency for fetching from memory. So we're yeah. using that, that place to do this dithering and to do this blending. It's a really cool technology. And uh, I had absolutely nothing to do with it. It's like the, these things just kind of popped out of the out of the wilderness. And again, I'm gonna I'm gonna name names. I think Gary is primarily responsible for this, <laughs> and uh, I, I'm grateful for it. You know, it's cool. I figured you would have been the one for this one because of so your history, no, your lineage. No, no. Yeah, am, you were you were just, Mr. G Sync, were you I'm not? Just a, I well, I was again a part of a big team that did G Sync, yeah. and, but yeah. I did have a little something to do with it. And but this one, I got to tell you, I I'm just like I'm, I'm like that guy that goes, well played, well played, and that's <laughs> we, that's we my need, that's my role here. <laughs> we need to meet this Gary fellow. Yeah, well, he's yeah. in London right now. He's probably asleep, Smart so he doesn't dude. get to hear any of this shit. But yeah, he's doing a great gotcha, job. Gotcha. Actually, I want to. All of our software architects are really uh, top notch, and and all of this kind of this is the beauty of Intel. Like all this random stuff is just happening all around the company, and every once in a while, you know, something happens that's beautiful, and and uh, yeah, it's just a delight to see. Nice. And one last question on on smooth sync is. Uh, enabling it effectively in terms of latency, like disabling vSync, or does it? Do you still have a vSync sort of latency impact? Well, vSync is off. So if you okay, think so about v it, yeah, yeah. vSync's off. There's no latency impact. The only impact is that dithering time, which is, as I mentioned, around 32 scan 32. lines. So uh, you, you can either think of that as delay, or you could think of it as, hey, we're just doing a dither, and you know that it's a blend. Nice. Got it. Intel software says they love you too. So they love you back. Baby. Where's Intel software here? Are <laughs> they watching right? this? Yeah, oh, there is a chat. Oh, there you go. So I want to figure out who that is. Who is that? There, there's a couple, a couple of things, but just a, a little bit of nuance before we move on from this. So if, if, if speed just, and I, I, I think I know the answer, but I, I just want you to explain it because you're a heck of a lot smarter. So with, with, with speed sync, right there, there is effectively no tearing. And yes. you effectively have VSync off as well. Why wouldn't you just use that? Is it because you, you tell us why? Okay. Well, Marco, that's an excellent question. And that's why I love coming here because that's an insightful <laughs> thing. Why wouldn't you do that? Right. Yes. But there's a dark side. Okay. And oh. I, I wasn't going to tell you, but you Cute asked. Vader. <laughs> okay. So the dark side is um, sometimes depending on your render rate, this, uh, 
fast sync technology can have a little judder to it because what you're doing is you're you're picking a frame to show and if that's not completely uniform from frame to frame because it won't be right you let's say for example you're running 140 hertz and you're showing it on a 60 hertz monitor you're going to get into a beat pattern when you're subsampling because you're going to basically pick one frame and then you're going to skip a frame and then you're going to pick another frame and then you're going to skip two frames and then you're going to pick a frame so the negative part of doing the subsampling is depending on the beat pattern between the refresh rate of the panel and the render rate of the game, you might think it sucks, right? So think of it as uh, in certain cases, and especially as render rates go high, as you're really running fast, then that beat pattern is not very apparent. So in those cases, I would just, you, you know, I would do fast sync. I would do um, speed sync. On the, uh, on the other hand, this blending technique works and it doesn't have any of that beat pattern kind of behavior. Got it, got it. Yeah. So. Other Maybe technologies that are like. similar suffer from the same problem. Yes. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to answer. I believe I know the answer to this question. And if I'm wrong, you correct me, Tom. So yes, sir. as we were showing slides before, um, somebody commented and said, oh, no, no HDMI 2.1 48 gigabits per second. Mm -hmm. And I think I think I asked something similar way back. And the answer may have been the spec wasn't completed by the time you guys completed your display engine. Is, I believe, is that sort of correct? Uh, well, I don't, you know, I don't want to say because I'm not 100% certain of why. But I, I will say that there, you know, there are, I guess they're called PCOMs that are doing converters between HDMI 2.0 and 2.1. And, and effectively, that's an option. Um, but, you know, honestly, I'm a little bit out of my wheelhouse on, on the whole evolution of that decision and the timing. And I'm also a little bit out of my wheelhouse on what's the what's the fix for right now. But that's my best guess. Gotcha. Got gotcha. And we just so had another. You, oh, sorry, Dave. Go were ahead. you hinting? Were you hinting that you, when you said pecans that um, an OEM could enable a converter and a machine for, uh, for that me, capability? Give me. I'm going to do a. a I don't want to put you on the spot. No, no, no. Don't worry. Give, <laughs> give me. Just stall for like 30 seconds, okay? <laughs> Hey, Marco, do your soft shoe, buddy. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> All right. Exactly. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Either. I'm almost there. It's good. It's good. It's good. Right, we're going to talk about XESS okay, next. We're running. I'm going to co come back to that one. I'll give you like a wink when I'm ready to talk about it. Right, so I'm <laughs> yeah. going to answer a, another question that came in too. Uh, we have Crispy Silicon oh, asking yeah, resizable, uh, bar. resizable bar support. Yes, ARC yes. has resizable bar support. Yes, it and, does. Uh, it, yeah, so it, it might be there might be some platforms that it's not enabled by default, what have you, but it's it's in there. It's in the support is there for a resizable bar. Mm -hmm. Let me scroll All up right. through the chat list here. Am I missing any questions? We had a um, another question from MMW asking about you know will Intel focus on driver updates and optimizations? And Intel Graphics answered <laughs> in the chat. Always. So, yes. Always. I want to yeah. know who that is. I want to know who that is. We got, we got <laughs> a couple of plans. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, but I right. can say That's I can good. say the driver updates is super exciting. We also talked about a new technology called Arc Control, which is our kind of our our overlay. It's real time. You hit a hotkey, pulls up an overlay on top of your game, and it can access all your settings, and you can do your streaming stuff from there. It also does driver updates, so it'll be connected up to our server, and depending on how users opt in or opt out, they'll get automatic driver updates and silent installs. It's just you know, it's just going to make drivers almost a non-issue. And, and we did say that we expect to have roughly monthly updates on drivers, and it might be slightly faster depending on uh, key game launch titles and more betas. Nice. Yep. Yes. Good to have the update cadence. No question about it. Okay. Yeah, so I'm ready. I'm ready. I got a wink for you. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hit it. So we did Hit it on support HDMI 2.1. Okay. So okay. several OEMs are doing uh, pecan based designs for HDMI 2.1. So it, it is a it is a technology that you can put down extra silicon onto the board to gasket to that uh, new interface. Now it adds costs, so it's a it's a subset of OEMs. But if you care about that technology, you can find it on uh, OEM designs. That's one of the cool parts about doing a notebook. Yeah. Absolutely. Cool. All right. So we're going to talk some XESS. Marco? Let's yeah, it. let's do it. So perfect timing. A question came in from Kevin about uh, yeah. how does XESS compare with DLSS? But before you get up. there, I noticed something, something interesting. So when, you know, the press gets, gets briefed a little bit early before some events happen. And during the briefings, you guys had mentioned 15 XESS games. And by the time you actually came to do the Prezzo, you had said, uh, 20 XESS games, around 20 at launch. 
So first, we should probably tell everybody what XCSS is. And then can you talk about, you know, how it's implemented in software and how uh, ISV um, reception has been to XCSS? Sure, I will. So this is a great picture to talk through. If you're not a mathematician, you can skip that big slide that I did, which is all the vector math. On this one, <laughs> <laughs> I noticed yeah. that you didn't pull that one up, Marco. Did you, we didn't you, put pull that one. you didn't put that Do in the article? I, I, no, it's here. I mean, it's here. Hold it's, on, it's, hold on. it's there, but it's uh, it's deep stuff, Tom. Nice. It, I felt I felt like that might have been a little bit too much. A little bit too much. I don't it's know. never too. Geek. There's never too much technical detail. Never too much geek. <laughs> yeah. Never too much. Yeah. So, do you want this know. one or no? No, no. no. I think you're, no, no, you're, no. I don't All think right. it's in there, Marco. The um, the three D you didn't put it in there. I knew yeah. it's in here. Blow out model. I could have sworn I put it in. <laughs> Let's go back to the XCSS one. We'll just talk. All about right, it. we're going. We're going. Yeah. We're going. All right. Wow. The matrix. Matrix Jesus. math is what he Jesus. modeled in 3D, which... Yeah, I thought yeah, it blew people away. Like, even Kelt was complaining you. about my va my matrix math. I'm like, dude, it's beautiful. He's like, no, <laughs> It is not. pretty, but no, yeah, it's not. explaining it isn't so pretty. <laughs> Do you you right. know what? I, could, I think I have the Prezo. No, don't even up. worry about okay, it. Let's okay. just we'll stay right here. So XESS, okay. <laughs> XE super sampling. Yes. All right, look at the picture on the left-hand side. What's happening mm. is we're, we're trying to improve performance of games primarily, right? And the way we're doing it is we're rendering at a lower resolution, which is normally going to look not great. Because if you play, I know I know you guys have played at low resolution. It looks a little blurry. It looks a little chunky. It's not something that you normally want to play at 1080p if you have a higher res monitor. What we do is we take that low res render and we put it through uh, XESS engine, which is basically going to take motion vectors and it's going to take uh, prior rendered frames. And it's going to take uh, an AI, which is a convolutional neural network using XMX array. So it's a systolic array built into every um, Arc GPU. So we run this algorithm in post and we generate this high res image that's beautiful. And it's it's like rocket science. It's like magic. And, and what's actually happening is a lot of knowledge is being generated uh, by running lots of training cycles and it's being embedded into the network that's represented by that kind of like blue web in there and all of that information can sort of manifest itself into these improved and beautiful pixels that we generate at the end of the day so the idea is raise performance by reducing the render workload in the traditional render add a very fast uh, upsample ai using xmx and the net is a is a, a big benefit to uh, frame rate. So that's the way I think about it. Got and it. and how does it differ from you know we have DLSS from NVIDIA and, DLSS, yeah, and it's you know different than FSR from AMD. Mm -hmm. How do you got? How does Intel differentiate there? Well, the the truth is XMX is optimized for Intel. You know the whole XESS is optimized on XE, XMX. So we have custom fused kernels. We have a different network topology. We have different training that we do. So while they seem similar, uh, kind of at the high level, we're both applying AI to do super sampling. Um, they they both take similar inputs from the game engine, like depth depth buffer, motion vectors, and prior rendered frames, but the entire mechanisms are different. Uh, everywhere from the network topology to how it gets trained, how it gets applied. So I, I feel like this is the new uh, domain of competition, right? There's, there's a whole new thing happening that I keep uh, getting more and more excited about. And it's how are we going to apply AI to render and, and AI to graphics? And so XESS and DLSS are kind of like two algorithms that are battling it out there. Uh, someday they'll probably be one from AMD when they get a systolic array. But um, this is just the beginning. Right? There's going to be more applications of AI techniques to render, maybe maybe on the geometry side, maybe on denoising, you know, who knows? But um, this is an area that uh, is super fertile. And while right now we're kind of saying, well, what's DLSS versus XCSS? That's, that's an interesting thing to talk about, and you're probably going to do some direct comparisons. But it's much more important to understand we're at the kind of the beginning of many algorithms that are going to be integrating more closely with game engines. So it's pretty cool. So so Intel is doing um, training for your neural network, your models. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So all of the models, um, right now we have one model that works for all games. It's kind of our strategy. If we end up finding that we need to change that, we obviously we can. But it's, an, it's a tremendous investment just to, you know, ingest all this data run it through your neural network process. And I don't know if you guys have ever visited a data scientist or any kind of the, how do you do AI? Um, mm. But there's there are engineers who just do this one thing. They're like, I'm looking at my data sources. I'm looking at like, how do I, what's a good pattern to train with? And then they build giant data centers that are both generating that data, warehousing that data, and then bringing it to 
a training computation. And, and it's a, a large scale effort. Um, and we're just starting to really ramp that up. It's, it's going to be a huge uh, part of our, our, our technique going forward. Very cool. Thanks for the insight. You Good got stuff. it. You got it. We ought to bring you out to our training thing sometime. I'd love to see if it. we, if, if I, we, you know, are ready. I don't know. Oh, yeah. so we're ready. And the then, machines are ready. So we, we can be ready. <laughs> perfect. Perfect segue here. Cause there is also nuance with XCSS. Um, B Kareem yeah. asking, does this mean XCSS will not be usable with non arc GPUs? Now yeah, the answer is, right is there. you can use <laughs> XCSS on non arc GPUs if they support DP four a, can you give some yeah. color on that Tom? Well, in the short term, we're focusing on the ARC implementation for XESS, which is XMX based, right? So we're trying to get our, our algorithms and our house baked first for the for the Intel GPUs that we're launching. That's kind of the number one priority. Later this fall, we'll be making our DP4A version available, and that will be open source, right? So effectively, other implementations could be done that are uh, open. And it's really a question of the game developer and even to some degree, the hardware vendor, if they wanted to optimize it and enable it. Even um, there's a there's layers of, of goodness here, right? We can make the code available, but there's still a tuning part that most people would want to do to make the algorithm run well on their hardware. Got it. Got it. We are going to go in a completely other direction. The chat? <laughs> completely yeah, so, different direction. Well, oh, because yeah, okay. it, it's it, so it is, we'll probably have to follow up with this one. I'm going to think. So we have okay. a question from someone named, I should think of a channel name sometime. Wow. He's asking, can you tell us more about single root IO virtualization? Ooh, XP I mean, there you go, baby. <laughs> We're Damn. going super Damn, nerdy. I went down on that one. I got nothing to say there. I'm, I'm just a, <laughs> totally not What's an that for acronyms? Space. Yeah, You yeah. got me, whoever you are, channel guy. <laughs> yeah, that's that's someone Nailed from me. Intel throwing a wrench exactly. in the works there. Exactly. That's all right. That's Jeff right. McVeigh That's right, right there. I can smell it. There you go. There you go. <laughs> what else? Let's see. Uh, what do we, what do so, we, what you do know, we here's, this, this is sort of on the same topic. It, it, again, it, we're just talking about the future here. Um, do you expect uh, matrix mul multiplies to become more widely adopted in gaming? Is there? Oh, yeah. You would, no, go ahead. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, sorry, Marco. I didn't mean to cut you off. But no. the whole question is. AI, right? The only reason he's asking about matrix, I mean, matrix multiplies are critical to graphics in general, but those are those are more implemented uh, basically in the CPU. You kind of do it once and set up once per frame. What we're talking about here for embedded hardware matrix multiplies is all about doing those in real time on every frame or every other frame. And that's going to become very, very important and part of the graphics pipeline. But I don't think it's like game developers are going to I mean, they could create algorithms that are specific to IHVs, um, but I suspect they're all looking for middle layers. Like, like if we can provide XCSS as an SDK that they can integrate and get the benefit of our work on systolic, including things like fused kernels and all that kind of stuff, they're going to probably opt for that rather than roll their own matrix multiply kind of kernel into the game engine itself. Got it. And and matrix multiplies or even your XMX engines are, are starting to get utilized in content creation too, right? 100%. Yeah, the XMX engine is... Um, it is a matrix multi, uh, multiply engine. The matrix engines are there to do multiple, multiply accumulates. And um, that's core to AI in general. That's the first reason it's there because obviously AI is disrupting every industry. AI is a very important workload for ARC. And that's why there's a matrix engine. It's primarily there for AI. But, you know, matrix multiplies are a big part of many algorithms beyond AI. Traditional computer vision relies upon primarily matrix multiplications. So think of it as um, there's the killer app, which is, hey, what can we do with AI slash in every application, whether it's mm. media, whether it's uh, gaming, whether it's, uh, you know, data center. So that's the way I think about it. It's, it's critical for AI and critical for any large CV application. Very cool. Very cool. What else we got? Yep. You got some stuff in the chat, Margo? Yeah. Maybe? So, um, I've well, there's more questions, own, more questions on virtualization that we'll, we'll, we'll save, um, maybe for, thank you, time. Marco. Yeah. 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 <laughs> any, any, so let me just say Come anything on, on virtualization. Let's go get, let's go get one of the server guys, the there data center guys. So yeah. Dave, Dave, do your thing. And then I think we'll, we'll wrap up with some, uh, some desktop questions. Yeah, yeah, I had I had some questions on power. Um, can you give us a sense of how uh, gaming 
on battery might differ with arc versus maybe competing solutions and perhaps um, what power efficiency might be like some of the advantages of arc in that regard because obviously the first platform you're coming you're coming out with here or that you're introducing with arc are thin and light you know battery sensitive notebooks with you know whatever they are 50 to 60 watt hour batteries that yep. that need to support a discrete gpu now and so you must be doing some creative things there I just we are to um, what you, might um, say. you know uh, dave that's a, that's a great question this whole question of what would you do for battery optimized gameplay is is front and center in terms of what we're working on unfortunately i can't really describe um, the current technology because we're not really ready to talk about it yet but you you're correct there's lots of cool things that can be done to make a mobile gaming experience on battery better now uh, i've even talked to some folks about well what what would be nirvana here like if you really wanted to go to the next level of management of mobile gaming you'd really want the game to become aware of this like if if we and this is something that we we are not making much progress on yet but i want to the idea is that we uh inside we might create a new api that we call you know hey power management api for games and <laughs> what it does is it tells a game engine hey we are in a low power mode can you set your settings to be a lower power combination of settings. And so that's the type of things that are gonna move the needle a lot. And if we can find a way to make it easy for game engines and game developers to be power sensitive, that's the that's the biggest way to make this uh, better. Now, if we don't do that, we're left with things like, you know, power capping automatically or frame capping automatically, which are better experiences, but they're not as good as the, you know, the real Nirvana. Mm. Interesting. Cool. Mm -hmm. Well, glad you guys are working on that. Well, we're working on it. I wish I had more well. to say on it, but right now we're just still still getting in there. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Cool. What else you got, Marco? I've got another one too, but go for it. Yeah, just I just want to address um <clears throat> crispy silicon's asking, can we shed light crispy. on turbo? We we talked about that earlier. So as soon as we are not live any longer, the VOD will be on the channel. And it's about halfway through we talk about dynamic clocks. We'll put in a timestamp for you. Yeah. yeah. And Tom, is is I don't know if you guys if you could talk about this. Is there any hardware present uh, to accelerate convolutions in Arc? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, convolutions are effectively matrix multiplications. So if you if you look at a, a convolution, it's kind of a regional uh, and, and kind of strobing through data. And that's really what systolic arrays are very good at. So convolution, matrix multiply, got you covered. Cool. Go ahead, Dave. Do your thing. Yeah, no, um, question on thermal solutions, kind of staying in that uh, battery life and power realm. Um, have, does Intel or have has Intel um, introduced uh, sort of reference designs uh, or design, uh, you know, guidance with respect to cooling solutions, sort of like we've seen maybe with the other guys in Max-Q or, or some other, you know, approach where you're kind of setting the standard in terms of cooling solutions and thermals for relative to the GPU, I guess, but I guess yeah. it's a combo CPU and GPU. Well, you know, we have a, a long history of working with our OEM partners on notebook designs. So all of that infrastructure in a, in a group we call CCG, which is our client computing group, all of that now is dedicated or works with discrete GPUs. So think of it as that entire machinery that, that builds more than just reference platforms. They actually handhold the entire design effort with OEM partners to bring them to market. So you can think of it as, yes, we do do reference designs, but we also do, you know, marquee designs that are sort of white glove, uh, you know, this is, you know, here it is, this is what it should be. And that's brought to market through an OEM partner. Cool. Very cool. I wonder if we'll see like a, an Evo for gaming notebooks or something like that at some Absolutely. point. Absolutely. Well, actually, oh. the first step is all of our ARC designs initially are Evo platforms. So if you sure. look at you look at the notebooks that are coming out, they're all Evo. And I, whether we create a different name for notebook gaming, I, I don't know. That's a that's kind of bigger than my brain can handle. But uh, <laughs> right now, Evo is is our brand for notebook high, thin and light. And that's where these ARC GPUs are, are landing. I think I think your brain can probably handle it, Tom. But perhaps <laughs> you're 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 not allowed to handle that kind of stuff for now. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> I can't get my head around it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Marco. I, I I see you've got something lurking in the uh, in the gallery there. But uh, yeah, yeah. Ooh, you know, that's what's lurking. Sexy. Sexy. Ooh, hey. 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 I Look almost shroud, baby. <laughs> I almost photoshopped. I know nobody else took the time to extract that from the video. I almost photoshopped it onto my test bench and made people think I had one. But That's whatever. A great but, idea. That yeah, great I really, idea. I really should have done it because it would have went all over the web. Oh my gosh! But, you know, sure we're running out of time, 
And I know today was about mobile because this launch was about, you know, the, the Arc 3 is coming first, followed by Arc 5 and 7 uh, in early summer, and then discrete desktop uh, also in summer. What can you tell us about the card that you showed off here? We'll start with that question because I don't want to get well, you in any trouble. Mm. Um, you have seen the movie, I believe, and the movie does do a full 360 pan, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, right? This movie here, yes, that's, that's the one. The one. Why, why don't we just watch that for a second? See what we show here. Sure. Let me see what they say. I don't know if I've ever seen this one before. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. 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 It's got a chip. Okay. Here, I'm going to walk you through all the disclosures. Okay. There's okay. a chip. There's some capacitors. <laughs> Yep, some power. Array. There's a power. There's a base plate. There's there you go. Oh, look, there's a thermal. Are, it looks like a four really cool. pipe, fin pipe, four pipe. Yeah. yeah, and look at that dual axial, dual axial fan. Nice, pipe. nice. Got a little cover there. Mm, six. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, any other questions? And it lights up. <laughs> and it lights up. <laughs> did it light up? I don't know. Did it light up? It did. The arc lit up. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It lit up. It lit up. I, I actually think it's a very attractive card. It's. It, oh wow! I didn't know we we swung around like that. Ooh. So there, <laughs> obviously, obviously. It is a uh, it is a, a dual axial uh, two slot uh, classic ATX power card. Did we show the power connectors? No, I don't think we showed the so. connectors. Ooh. No, but so that's interesting, right? And this, I think you could talk about this. This card yes. is based on DG the, the G10 chip that is Arc Seven. It's the same SOC technically, correct? I believe that is correct. Got to be okay. a full fat. Okay. Now, what can you do differently in a desktop GPU that you can't do in a mobile GPU? These are excellent questions, Marco. Yeah. And again, I wish, I wish I could talk more <laughs> about that, but this is not about desktop clocks. It's not about oh, desktop right. cards. <laughs> mobile, small right, form factor, right. Evo. We tried. We tried with the <laughs> wait, but wait, there's more. We tried. I think it's, it's a, pretty cool. I, I think the team that's worked on this has done a terrific job, and I'm excited to see this. I'm hoping to get one over here really soon. You know, right now I've got uh, a different one. Not that I don't like it, but I'm ready for a change. I'm ready for a change. <laughs> lift, lift, lift it up. <laughs> lift, lift up the card. You got one right there. Lift it up. Oh, you you want me to lift up the uh, the the, uh, the, card. the Intel one? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm no, I can't. But oh, can I show you this? Oh well, we better go solo here. What oh, can you oh, show oh. us? Oh, I can't show you. Can't. Uh, how, about, how, about, how about this? Can I show you? Huh? Okay. No, I, no, I can't oh, show you that. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Too much. It's got, it's got a card edge. We know that Too much. much. It's got, oh, yeah. Here. Look. That's messed up. That's messed up, Tom. <laughs> nope. Tease. Oh. He's a tease. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, a, it's got a PCB. We know that. It's got much. a PCB. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> Crazy. Oh. Good stuff. We, we tried, everybody. Um, we tried. Uh, we did. We did. <laughs> Good you were gonna. You were gonna say something about PCI Express power. Were you gonna tell us? I was not. I was not gonna okay. tell you anything. But <laughs> I was gonna. I was. I was just curious if they showed it because that would be interesting if they did. I don't think they did. They did not. No. So we don't know what the power demand is, but um, I'm sure it'll be. Uh, it'll be like a desktop card. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. I mean, it's gonna be right in there, right? Uh, and, and I can say that I am uh, just proud of the, all the work that's happened so far and we've come a long way but we're you know we're entering this with our eyes wide open right that's why we did mobile first and there are some fierce competitors out there that are going to you know i i, I don't want to even think about the calls i'm going to get but they're, they're going to want to put the hit on you they're yeah. going to be filled with love they're, i'll tell you that right now <laughs> filled with love and you know what i'm talking about <laughs> yeah <laughs> Tom Peterson, uh, it has been an absolute pleasure. It's been great catching up with you and picking your brain and uh, putting you on the spot. And I don't think this time, I think one time we interviewed you, we got you in a little bit of hot water. I don't really? think we did this time. No, you yeah. didn't get me in hot water. Dave, back in the. Yeah, well, I know no? you think you did. I know okay. you think you did. But I, tried. I, only, I, only, I only let you think that because you're. I love you. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. It's all about the love. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Well, Tom, <clears throat> thanks so much for your time today. It was a pleasure catching up with you. It was a pleasure. Good to see you, uh, Dave. Marco. Yeah. You look great. Your Both questions. Come, come see us at a live event soon. I want to get a, you know, have a beer and have a hug. It'd be great to see you guys live. We're that there. would be fabulous. We're looking forward to that day, and I'm sure it'll be soon. I'm, I think I'm thinking this summer, sometime or something like that. Yeah, we'll be on the West I'd Coast. Love to, love to. It's it's Call beginning me. to sound inevitable. Yes. Yes. All right, Tom Peterson from Intel, Intel fellow and resident smart guy and nice guy. Great, to, great you. to have you with us. Uh, everybody, um, hit thumbs up and subscribe. You can find us on the web at hothardware.com, twitter.com/slash hothardware, youtube.com/slash hothardware. 
Again, hit thumbs up and subscribe. We'd appreciate it. Stay tuned for Val Rojas. She'll be um, streaming on Hot Hardware Twitch later this evening. I believe she gets on around 9, 9.30 tonight. So stay tuned for her. She's a lot of fun, and she'll be game streaming. And one day, one day, hopefully, she'll be game streaming on an Intel Arc GPU. Right, Tom? That's coming. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> Tom Peterson from Intel. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. And take thanks, care. Guys. And thanks for stopping by. You got it.